The fork, the handkerchief, and a special nightdress all came in at roughly the same time in the history of the West. Why? Why did our bodily functions, such as eating, nose blowing, and sleeping, gradually become so shameful and embarrassing that they were cloaked in elaborate formality and ritual? to grow up into a fine lady, though I wasn't sure just what it involved. Like the ladies I saw on TV, I would behave in just the right way, wear the right clothes, live in the right house, speak the right words, marry the right man. Since the Middle Ages, patterns of proper behavior have been introduced in the upper class, and this new standard gradually permeates through the rest of society. So often, new forms of conduct have taken centuries to be considered the common standard for civilized behavior. The courtly class have always distinguished themselves from the rest of society by their rules of etiquette. Darling, little ladies don't because I'm your mother, that's why. Darling, just take a little bit on your fork at a time. Darling, because I'm your mother, that's why. Starting with the basics, I was taught to eat in a civilized manner. Our lives have increasingly been divided between the private and public spheres between upper and lower classes, men and women, civilized and uncivilized behavior. The result is so taken for granted, it is hardly perceived as conditioned behavior. To blow your nose in your hat or clothing is rustic. And to do so with your arm or elbow befits a tradesman. Nor is it much more polite to use your hand if you immediately smear snot on your garment. My father carried handkerchiefs, which my mother ironed one by one. He always tucked a special decorative one in his breast pocket. I was told these were reserved for... <laughs> Ladies in distress. It is polite to use a handkerchief and to do so while turning away if more honorable people are present. If anything falls to the ground while blowing the nose with two fingers, it should immediately be trodden away. The handkerchief was at first a symbol of prestige because it was rare, even in the upper classes, and expensive due to the lace. It took many years to spread through the rest of society. It's occupied. The young snobs prominently displayed their finely embroidered handkerchief or offered them to others. But once the handkerchief does come into common use, a new prohibition develops in the upper class. Once you have wiped your nose, Never look into the used handkerchief. When you have blown your nose, you should not open your handkerchief and look inside as if pearls and rubies have descended from your brain. This is a disgusting habit, which is not apt to make anyone love you, but rather if someone loved you already, they are apt to stop then and there. Not only do people tend to distinguish themselves from other classes of human beings, but from the animal world and so-called primitive societies, we are ashamed of the laws of nature that inevitably reduce us to animal functions. And our only defense is to conceal our bodily functions and cloak them in ritual. 
There survives a record of a conversation that took place in 1786 between the poet Delisle and the professor Abbe Consant. Consant brags about a dinner he had had at Versailles. Some court folk at Versailles last night. <laughs> and I'll wager you perpetrated a hundred incongruities. What do you mean? I did everything the same way as everyone else. What presumption. I'll bet you didn't do anything the same as anyone else. But I'll limit it to dinner. First, what did you do with your serviette when you sat down? My serviette? I did the same as everyone else. I unfolded it. I spread it out. And then I fixed it by a corner to my buttonhole. Well, my dear fellow, you were the only one to do so. One does not spread out one's serviette. One places it on one's knee. And how did you eat your soup? Like everyone else, I think. I took my spoon in one hand and my fork in the other. Your and... fork? Oh, good heavens. No one eats their soup with their fork. But tell me, how did you eat your bread? Like everyone else, I believe. I cut it neatly with my knife. Oh, dear. One breaks bread. You do not cut it. The fork is first mentioned in the 11th century by St. Peter Damien, who wrote of the Venetian dog's wife, whose body, after her excessive delicacy, entirely rotted away. She ate by means of little golden forks with two prongs. Even in 1605, Henry III of France and his courtiers are mocked for stretching their necks out over their plates. They would rather touch their mouths with their little forked instruments than with their fingers. Still, in 1837, Eliza Farrar condones, the convenience of feeding yourself with your right hand, armed with a steel blade, and provided you do it neatly, and do not put in large mouthfuls, or close your lips tightly over the blade. It took more than 800 years of change for eating with a fork to become the standard for civilized dining. When told to sit in another's house, do so at once. But take care there's nothing nasty on the seat. Don't put spit out food on your dish or dip meat in the salt cellar. Don't pick your nose or eyes or pick your teeth with the point of your knife. Don't scratch your hands or arms or spit on the table. That's bad manners. If your nose is snotty, don't wipe it with the hand with which you hold your food. Don't snuff up your snivel or make a loud whistle. Don't keep your hands on the table or wipe your teeth with the tablecloth. Whoso attends to these things will be the wiser. Whoso does not, is not worthy to sit at table. Really, my mother taught me everything I needed to know about manners, and more. She was the cook, unless we ate outdoors, in which case my father started the fire and grilled big juicy steaks in his very own special way.
Just as formal rules of etiquette keep our natural functions from the sight of others, so do the walls of the bedroom separate one person from another. Literally and figuratively, we cover ourselves from the sight of others as our lives are increasingly split between those public and private spheres. Can a people go naked or only half covered, be Christian or even become Christianized unless they clothe themselves? Are not those nations most morally refined in Christianity and civilization, those in which the costumes of men and women differ most essentially? As late as the 17th century, people slept nude. In medieval times, to sleep with clothes on aroused suspicion that one had something to hide. Only if we see how natural it was in the Middle Ages for strangers and for adults and children to share a bed, can we understand how profoundly the nature of human relationships has evolved. Today, not only is the nuclear family expected to provide a bed for each child, but a separate bedroom as well. No shame. Just look at the way she's dressed. People are going to die. Just look at the way she carries on. Can you believe she's it? never going ever. to be able to oh, please my a man. I'm my life is going to see anything like that. People are going to die. There were always certain things not thought fit for the public eye. I guess that's why my mother called the bedroom a sanctuary. I remember the first time I felt shame. Someone had caught me stark naked. I think I was fast approaching puberty. From that moment on, I covered my body, even when I was alone. <clears throat> Principally in her fashions, manners, words, gestures, and conversation, a woman ought to be much unlike a man. For right as it is seemly for him to have a certain madness and full steady, so doeth it well in a woman to have a tenderness, soft and mild, a kind of womanly sweetness in every gesture of hers, so that in going, standing, and speaking whatever she lusteth, may always make her appear a woman without any likeness of a man. When in the 16th century people did begin to wear clothes to bed, there was virtually no difference between the nightgowns for men and the nightgowns for women. Around the same time, women's clothes became longer and more layered, while men's clothes shortened until the robe worn by men died out completely. Only the supposedly quiet and reserved people like priests, academics, and women kept the traditional gown. Until the 19th century, it was quite acceptable for women to receive visitors wearing only their nightgown. It was in the 1800s that the bedroom became sacrosanct. Also in that century, the nightdress mirrored the corsets that were worn by women. They became suits of armor, laced and buttoned from the chin to the toes. A man must not embellish himself like a woman, or his adornments will contradict his person, as I see some men do who put uh, curls in their hair and in their beards with a curling iron and who use so much makeup that it would be unsuitable for any wench. Even the harlot who was more anxious to hawk her wares and sell them for a price. During the 19th century, men had rid themselves of any remnants of embroidery, color, wigs, or makeup. They wore the old nightshirt until the turn of the 20th century, when they adopted pajamas. Some would say the nightshirt was the last vestige of the feminine in a man's wardrobe. The turn of the century signaled the peak of distinction between men's and women's clothing. Throughout modern history, women have been segregated from men in terms of power and employment, and differentiated from them in dress and socialization. Until the late 19th century, etiquette was reserved for men. Rules for public behavior were written by and for men. A woman's place was in the home. 
the private realm. The qualities associated with private behavior obviously influenced the way she presented herself in public. Such a good housekeeper. Dinner's always never on the table. In out of 5.30 sharp. Oh, her hands are never idle. Oh, the sacrifices she makes for those children. Not all women were ladies, yet you didn't have to be high-born to be one either. The manners of a lady could, indeed, be learned. <laughs> In the 19th century, women increasingly became the authors of etiquette manuals, and as they moved into public life, the nature of etiquette changed, gradually, but significantly. Not only did this mark women's entry into the public sphere, but man's limited acceptance of her. Not surprisingly, the first etiquette books written by women criticized the behavior of men. Many of the suggestions for improvement in male behavior, however, were aimed at preserving the idea that men should protect and cater to women. Chew! But this we can begin to understand when we consider the overall social and economic position of women. Women, at least those in polite society, were determined to maintain whatever social gains they had acquired. Do not shake hands unless the lady puts out hers, which you may take as a sign of particular goodwill. In this case, you must not stop long, but the lady has again the right to prolong the interview at pleasure. It is she, not you, who must make the first move onwards. If she does this in the middle of a conversation, it is proof that she is willing you should join her. And if you have no absolute call to go your way, you ought to do so. But if she does so with a slight inclination, it is to dismiss you and you must then bow and raise your hat. I knew it when I wasn't conducting myself in a becoming manner. Ladies waited for men to open doors, pull out chairs, help them across the street. True ladies were modest and didn't attract attention. They showed sophistication but remained demure. Today's lady, I was told, treats everyone equally with kindness and consideration, and always places her own desires and feelings last. Mom, is this a lady? By the end of the First World War, most of the clothing that did not help free a woman's body became obsolete. For one thing, women started wearing pajamas after the war. Whether for fun or for practicality's sake, a page of history had been turned. Women were free of the imprisonment of the clothing that had characterized the 19th century. Over 70 etiquette manuals were published before 1910. Some people dismissed the notion of etiquette as trivial and insignificant. Others wished for a return to traditional ways. Those of the old order cried out in rebellion. Strong men wear no pajamas. They wear night shirts and they disdain men who wear such effeminate things as pajamas. Theodore Roosevelt, he wore a nightshirt. So did Washington, Lincoln, Napoleon, Nero, many other men. These arguments in favor of the nightshirt and against the pajama are put forward by Dr. Davis of Ottawa, Canada. He has formed a club of uh, nightshirt wearers. There's a branch in Montreal, and there's one right here in New York. Its aim is to repopularize the wearing of nightshirts as a sign of real manhood. It is the mother 
whose task to occupy her daughter's thoughts so incessantly with the good and the beautiful that there is left no time to brood upon such matters. A mother ought only once to say seriously, it would not be good for you to know such a thing. And you should take care not to listen to anything said about it. A truly well brought up girl will from then on feel only shame at hearing such things of this kind spoken of. Darling, little ladies don't because on your Darling, mother, that's don't why. Darling, Just take a little bit on your fork at a Darling, time because on your mother, that's why. Good manners, she'd say, let people know just what kind of girl you are and the behavior you expect from others. Good manners tell people you're a lady and they can turn any scoundrel into a gentleman. Without rules of etiquette, every day we would think twice about where to lay knives and forks on the table. Mind you, good manners can never replace kindness and goodwill. But since people rarely dig beneath the surface, one might as well behave properly. If people were going to take me at face value, I'd show them. I'd play the game. <laughs>